For Pacifica Radio, June 30th, 2019, I'm Scott Horton. This is Anti-War Radio. All right, you guys, welcome to the show. It is Anti-War Radio. I'm your host, Scott Horton. I'm the author of the book, Fool's Errand, Time to End the War in Afghanistan, and the editor of antiwar.com. And speaking of which, today's episode is dedicated to the memory of Justin Raimondo, for many years our editorial director and head writer there, who died of lung cancer on Thursday. Uh, If anyone is interested in reading Justin's obituary and other articles about him, they're all up at the top of the page right now at antiwar.com. All right, you guys, introducing Elijah Magnier. He has been covering war since at least Iraq War I in 1991. Uh, I only recently learned, and all of the Middle Eastern wars since is a real expert, and uh, I think we all know has a lot of great stuff coming out of the war in Syria about who's zooming who in that one. And lately he's been writing about the situation between the U.S. and Iran some incredibly important pieces. They're all at E.J. Magnier, and that's I-E-R, EJMagnier.com. Uh, here's one. Iran has warned to target Arab countries in case of war. The U.S., like a lion in a Persian story. Well, I guess that's going to be the first question. Second, this one is called Iran and Trump on the edge of the abyss. Welcome back to the show. How are you doing, Elijah? Hello, Scott. Thank you for having me again. Uh, very happy to have you here and to read your stuff, man. I've been learning a lot lately here, got to say. So let's start with the lion. What's the Persian story you're referring to here? Well, it's an old story about the behavior of a lion. And uh, in, the, in the 80s, Imam Khomeini was dealing with uh, President Carter about uh, more or less the same crisis between the U.S. and Iran. And he told the story that Sayyid Ali Khamenei, the actual leader of the revolution, um, uh, repeated. And uh, he said the behavior of the U.S. can be compared to the story of a lion in Persian fable. Carton most probably didn't know about this story. Although it pains me to compare Carton to a lion, this is where what uh, um, uh, Imam Khomeini was saying, the story fits him perfectly, and this is where the leader come in, he's saying the story fits today with Trump. And he says, when a lion faces his enemy, it roars and breaks wind to scare his enemy. And then the lion ends up by shaking his tail, hoping for a mediator. Today, the US is mimicking the lion's behavior. So it is shouting, launching menace and threat that's comparing to roaring just to scare the uh, Iranians. But on the other hand, it's continuing to call for mediation and talk and uh, uh, just to, at the same time, it's saying, we're going to attack you, we can do, we, our attack is going to be massive and uh, to the level of uh, obliteration. And that is compared also to breaking wind to the Iranian. So it's saying that all these are words in the air and uh, words nothing. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, that's a pretty good take. I mean, overall, uh, I think you and I have talked about this before, but certainly uh, seems to be the case here that so much of our Middle Eastern policy in this entire century long has been about trying to figure out how to get at Iran some other way than attacking Iran. Persia's just too big, too many mountains, too many people, too long and hard of a slog to really do a, an, an invasion or a war of regime change of any kind there. And we can't get away with a coup like 53. And so they thought if they got rid of Saddam, then that would give them sway and influence over the Iraqi Shia majority. And then that would give them influence over Iran. Oops, that backfired. Then they thought, well, if we help Al Qaeda target Assad in Syria, that'll help bring Iran down a peg by uh, weakening their Arab ally Assad there, their other one after Maliki at that point. Uh, But nope, that backfired and only improved Iran's position inside Syria, made Syria more dependent on Iran than ever before, in fact, and Hezbollah too. And so 
Uh, we could go on to Yemen and what have you. But so much of this is in the name of trying to spite Iran and get at Iran because of the fact that they know that they really can't have a war. They know that even in the event, as you're talking about in this article, in the event of an air war, never mind sending in the Army and the Marine Corps, which no one is talking about. They know that forget it's completely off the table. But even a massive air war would include a massive, at least, missile war and uh, and other forms of war on the part of the Iranians back against the U.S., and they know that. Yes, that's absolutely correct. So um, what the Iranians are saying, we are going to target U.S. bases. Uh, if they attack us from the Emirate, we are going to attack the U.S. in the Emirate and the Emirate itself because the hosting country is also responsible and should be uh, held accountable. If they attack us from Saudi Arabia, the same. From Bahrain, is the same. From anywhere they attack us, we're going to respond against the U.S. bases and against the hosting country. Now, when Trump talks about a massive airstrike and not sending boots on the ground or men, the Marines on the ground, um, I mean, he's really um, not, uh, being very straight with the American people because Iran has thousands of uh, missiles base spread all over the country. And it is impossible for any superpower to destroy over 3,000 to 3,600 missile locations all over the country in 24 hours. So if this is going to take several days or several weeks, Iran will have the time to launch back and then cause a serious uh, casualties among the Americans and their allies in the region. Mm -hmm. So inevitably, if you call on Iran, Iran is going to retaliate. And so far, Iran is only being on the defensive because the, it is considered that the um, economic sanctions are an act of war. Mm. Uh, am I right? I know they have satellite guided this and that too, but... Uh, isn't it the case that to take out the surface-to-air missiles that you need special operations forces on the ground with laser designators to target? That is one, but it's also possible to do it via cruise missiles mm -hmm. um, you when you them. identify the target. This is what Iran did when they bombed uh, thousands of kilometers away the location of ISIS in Syria, launching missiles from Iran and also against the Kurds in uh, Iraq. So if we're talking about cruise missile, it is impossible to intercept uh, whatever the uh, interception missile system is good and whatever system you have, a cruise missile flies on very low altitude mm -hmm. and reaches the target and closes all its electronic. So the disturbance is um, immune to any disturbance Anyway, so, so in other uh, words, the Navy and the Air Force actually could have an argument that they could do an air war without even having to send in special operations forces to take out the anti-aircraft. I'm not saying that's a compelling argument to me or anything, but I'm just saying that could be part of their argument is that no literally zero boots on the ground. Yeah, that's true. They can do that. But at the same time, they will receive the same. They will receive the same cruise missile against them. So it is a tit for tat. They can destroy, let's say, because they are stronger, 100 locations, and Iran can destroy in exchange 10. But these 10s are going to be very hurtful. Mm. You know, I had a guy who was, um, I think he was, well, anyway, he was an experienced Navy guy from the Cold War days. And he told me that, you know, the Americans knew for many decades even, I think, or certainly for many, many years, that they could fight, never mind submarines, but in terms of surface ships anyway, that the Americans could fight the Soviets from way over the horizon. And they had such a longer range to hit Soviet ships, you know, in a way where they just had absolute superiority in this, on the seas. And that they know that if in the event of Iran, they're not going to have an aircraft carrier within cruise missile range. They're going to be way, way over the horizon in a way to protect their boats. But the thing about that is, what are they going to do about the bases in Bahrain and Qatar and Kuwait and Iraq and Afghanistan You can't and Saudi Arabia? You can't sail those away over the horizon. They're stuck right there across the Gulf, right in crosshairs, already targeted probably. Yeah, well, uh, here I'm going to give you another two points. First, that is possible to do if 
your enemy, in this case Iran, is doing nothing in watching you destroying uh, the country and just watching until you finish. And this is not going to be the case. But we're not talking only about targeting U.S. bases in the Middle East. We're talking about Iran with the capability of 2,000 kilometers missiles. Who says in case of a large war that the, ba the U.S. bases are in Europe are going to be spared? I mean, so far, Europe is not offering anything to the Iranians. And I'm here not speculating, Scott. Hey guys, a quick programming note for you. If you signed up for the Just the Interviews feed at the Libertarian Institute, you're probably going to need to go over and sign up at scotthorton.org instead, or at least if you're on iTunes there. Uh, iTunes has canceled the Just the Interviews feed from the Institute, I guess just because it's redundant with the scotthorton.org feed. So either go over to scotthorton.org and sign up for Just the Interviews there, or stay at the Institute and sign up for the other podcast feed, and then that way you'll get my show, plus the great Kyle Anzalone, Pete Raymond, and of course, Patrick McFarlane and Keith Knight as well. That's all at scotthorton.org or libertarianinstitute.org. Well, and so what about, uh, let's get to the ships here, because obviously the American government's version of the story is that Iran did it, which makes that angle very suspicious. And then there's all kind of anomalous things here. They blame a mine, but you have all these explosion marks are from quite above the waterline in, I think, all six cases. I don't know, that may be... Uh, overstating it but uh then you have you know the owner of the japanese ship saying we were hit by a flying object not a mine on the other hand uh you make the case in your articles that this is just absolutely part and parcel of iran's strategy against the united states that they're showing that they are masters essentially of asymmetric warfare that this is the very least of what they can do to resist american domination if it really comes to a war but so is that just a correlation that you just think it really makes a lot of sense that they must have done it or you know that they did it? Well, let's put it this way. First of all, Iran is a primary suspect. Second, Iran is not afraid for people to say the Iranians are behind the attacks. Third, there are no proof that Iran did it and that suits Iran. And fourth, Iran is saying again and again and again, if we don't export our oil, nobody's going to do it. Nobody's going to export this oil from the Middle East. That's very clear. So disregarding who did it, the message is there. You want to prevent us from exporting our oil. There is no oil export from the Middle East. And 15 to 20% of the world oil export is going to be neutralized in the Gulf. So it does make sense, right? I mean, first of all, it doesn't make too much sense as a false flag, I guess, because it's not enough to start a war over. It does make more sense, as you're saying, as a demonstration of Iranian power uh, on the very low end there. But haven't you written that you have sources inside the Iranian government who have confirmed to you that, yes, indeed, they did it? Well, I've never said they've did it. I said... Iranians are not afraid to say they have done it, although, yes, in a way, I am saying they are behind it. Mm -hmm. Secondly, it is not enough to start a war, as indeed you said rightly, because Iran did not inflict any human casualty. In the first case, the, um, the uh, sabotage act was against uh, tankers in territorial water that belonged to the Emirates. So that is very local and nobody can complain about it, but the Emirates should look after its own security. And the second one also didn't attack U.S. personnel, and the damage was against uh, ships, not against people. And the implication for Iran to say, we've done it, it means they are responsible for the act, and they uh, inevitably have to respond in case of, uh, to pay the uh, uh, compensation for the damage, and they are not respecting the, the international water. This is why Iran is not officially saying we are behind it. But I can tell you, Iran is not afraid for people to say they are behind, they are the primary suspect, although there are not uh, evidence uh, to confirm that Iran did it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it really is kind of a mystery because, you know, people are pointing out that not just the president, but the Ayatollah himself was sitting down with the Japanese prime minister at the time that 
a Japanese boat was being attacked, then I think Bernard at Moon of Alabama pointed out that actually that boat was flagged Panamanian and that whoever hit it might not have realized that it was owned by a Japanese company. Although, to attack anything while they're sitting down with the Japanese prime minister seems to be, you know, a pretty big deal. It doesn't seem like the kind of thing that the IRGC would do to embarrass the Supreme Leader. To embarrass, I think you may have even written this or treated Parsi, somebody was right. Sure, to embarrass Rouhani, yeah. I mean, the IRGC hates Rouhani and they love embarrassing him. But to do that to the Ayatollah seems a pretty big deal. At, at the same time, for the Ayatollah to have ordered it and to have it happen while he's meeting with the Japanese prime minister, bringing sort of kind of a message of peace would seem like a pretty big affront too, especially to the Japanese with their honor code and all that kind of thing. No. Well, there are several points in what you just mentioned here. First of all, the Ayatollah, there are many, I mean, there is a misunderstanding about the power of the Ayatollah. The Supreme leader has a power over the entire country, but he's not someone who is following step by step, every single decision. He gives the the uh, guidelines and the details. Uh, it's up to the uh, people on the ground to decide how and where to act. Secondly, in an act of war, it depends on the opportunity. So when the opportunity presents itself, then the attack uh, can take place. And a third, what did Japan bring to the Grand Ayatollah or to Iran? Nothing. Japan came to say, we want to uh, mediate for the liberation of five Americans who are captured in Iran, and we would like the tension to de-escalate. I mean, these are words, Iran can't do anything with these words. Iran wants to know if Japan is going to buy the oil. And the prime, the Abe, the, the Japanese prime minister said, I can't buy your oil. So what on earth you are doing here to just mediate for U.S. Uh, citizens who are prisoners in Iran. And uh, uh, we have offered the U.S. to mediate for Iranian prisoners that are in the U.S. And this demand was uh, denied. And the last point I would like to say, Rouhani and the IRGC today are in a perfect harmony. Although there is a difference in uh, between the two sides, between the pragmatic and the more radical, but we saw Trump pushing Rouhani to extreme because, first of all, Rouhani did everything in his power to convince the Grand Allah to allow him to negotiate with the Americans. And after a long effort, the Ayatollah accepted. And Rouhani was showing his victory. They even uh, made a, st a statue to uh, Zarif at the foreign ministry in the street of Tehran for him uh, managing to uh, conclude the nuclear deal with the Americans. And people were happy, finally, they're going to have good relationship with the Americans. And then here you have Trump saying, I'm going to tear this agreement apart. I don't want it. So Rouhani felt really disappointed, not by the Grand Ayatollah or by the IRGC, but by the Americans with whom he has negotiated for years mm -hmm. to strike, to, to get at the end of the day, just a, a deal that is suitable for everybody and where Iran is not going to get this nuclear bomb. And Iran never said, I'm going to get my nuclear bomb. And just to give a, a small details, it was first the Americans who offered the first reactor, nuclear reactor to Tehran University at the time of President Eisenhower in 1953. So it's not Iran having a nuclear capacity or not. It is the Islamic Republic that is anti-Israel that is not allowed to have a reactor, uh, to have a, a nuclear uh, capability. Mm -hmm. Well, and that's really the key, right? Not a nuclear weapon or a nuclear weapons program, but a nuclear capability at all, even a latent nuclear deterrent, like a civilian electricity program that could be reconfigured. Even that is, quote, this is from Scott Ritter's book, Target Iran, where he talks about the Israeli intelligence officers and, and policymakers, saying for them, for Iran to have any nuclear technology is tantamount to them having a nuclear weapons program. 
And so, wow, what a great magic word that you can just do whatever you want with tantamount. This and that are tantamount. So set it on fire. Yeah, indeed. Um, and now, so here's part of the problem, too, I think, Elijah, and I'm not sure if you agree with this or what, but I'd be happy to hear your take. But I think part of the problem is, is that Trump is really dumb. And he started out with, you know, attacking the nuclear deal, essentially just for political purposes, to be the most stark in the Republican primary campaign on, you know, this uh, very high profile Obama arrangement, so-called accomplishment that he was trying to tear down. And of course, you have massive Republican Party financiers like Sheldon Adelson, who represent the Likud Party and their interests in the country who, of course, are hawks on this and were against the deal all along. And it seems to me he thinks the policy is good cop, bad cop till we get a better deal, whereas the bad cops in his administration are actually really just deliberately sabotaging negotiations in order to pick a fight. What do you think of that? Well, I think, first of all, uh, Trump had a good team before uh, with uh, Tillerson and Mattis around him. And there were people with a lot of common sense and trying to bring some sense to Trump. And second, we see that Trump is kicking everybody out and firing everybody, and now uh, surrounded with uh, Pompeo, who is telling the American people, I lie, we are, le- we are taught to lie, we lie all the time. So how people can believe anything Pompeo would say? And then we have another person who is John Bolton, national security advisor, who just his favorite song is Bomb, 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 Iran. Uh, and um, uh, that doesn't, that is not diplomacy. And a third, when uh, the uh, Trump administration is doing, uh, is putting sanction, imposing sanction on the Granite Allah, who doesn't have any account, not even in Iran. And uh, can you imagine outside Iran or on Zarif? is not only to sabotage the, uh, uh, the negotiation, but it's just there is no sense in the uh, decision that are taken by the White House. I mean, these decisions just make people uh, disrespect the United States and say, who on earth is leading this country? And this is not going to go anywhere. And the last I'm going to add is when someone like Trump tell the uh, Iranians I threaten you with total obliteration. So he is hinting toward using nuclear weapons against them. That is against the law. And how can you imagine a country like Iran or any other country to say, okay, we give up on all our defensive missiles. We're not going to have missiles and you can and annihilate us anytime you want. It doesn't make sense. There's no room for logic even even for amateurs in foreign policy. Mm. Well, and you know, he's under the influence of these liars, too. He doesn't know the first thing about anything, so they gave him a talking point that 2,000 out of the 4,500 Americans who died in Iraq War II were killed fighting the Shia, and, and then therefore every bomb that they set off was an Iranian bomb. So the typical propaganda line there, which is already way out of proportion, is 600. But that just magically becomes 2,000. Don't forget, Iran killed 2,000. In other words, half of the American casualties in Iraq, uh, even though they were backing the same side as us in that whole thing uh, against the the Sunni side there. Um, This kind of propaganda where, uh, you know, also, of course, there's the Israeli forged so-called smoking laptop that was pretended to be smuggled out, stolen from an Iranian scientist. The whole thing was a hoax. But in there are essentially fake blueprints for a nuclear warhead, which Gareth Porter and, in fact, even David Albright uh, poured cold water on this when David Sanger at the New York Times tried to push it. Even David Albright, of all people, said that, no, this is all wrong. And Gareth later showed that, in fact, at the time that the document was forged, the Iranians were already working on the later version of the missile that had an entirely different shape, nose cone, uh, a more bottle nose rather than... Uh, conical tip on the end of it and so the whole thing was you know clearly a fraud it, it, it couldn't possibly have been real but 
it's very simple and easy to imagine that that would have been one of the talking points that John Bolton would have told Trump that, oh, yeah, we have these blueprints where they're working on nuclear warheads for these missiles, even though, of course, what they represent is an entirely different thing, a defensive threat with conventional explosives. Well, if we look at what's happening today in the Gulf, and let us assume that is Iran behind all these attacks, just uh, at a, a matter of assumption. Iran didn't need nuclear uh, weapons to stop the flow of oil into the world. Uh, those who attacked the tankers needed a very primitive uh, magnetic mine to stop the tanker and just send a message that this is possibly going to be the case of many other tankers. So you really don't need excessive, excessive uh, fire uh, power to convince the enemy or to send messages abroad. And also during a war, we can see today with the Yemeni and the Saudis, the Saudi with all their modern uh, weaponry, the modern U.S. jet, the weapons from Saudi, from uh, the Great Britain and France, they're fighting people, miserable people like uh, the Houthi in Yemen, who are trying to develop themselves, defend themselves. And after four years of war, the Houthi are imposing a new rule of engagement on the Saudis, and they're hitting one airport against airport. So if Saudi hit uh, Sana'a airport, the uh, Houthi will hit Nijran airport or Abha airport in Saudi Arabia. So you really don't need nuclear weapons to fight your war. And another point I would like to go back to on the Iraq war and the Iranian killing 2,000 men. Now, first of all, Bush declared uh, Iraq an occupation, uh, the, the U.S. forces in Iraq as occupation forces. And in Europe, as in the United States, you really understand what resistance mean against the enemy or against the occupier. The Iraqis stood against the Americans because the Americans didn't learn how to deal with the Iraqis. And the first thing Paul Bremer said, dismantling the whole army and put 400,000 men in the street without any uh, security and anything. So inevitably it's going to be an insurgency against the occupation forces, while today, we can see the um, a government of Iraq, of Adel Abdel Mahdi, saying the Americans are here under the Iraqi request. They are under our protection. They are our guests. They are supporting us, and we want them to stay. They are no longer occupation forces. And the, the other day, when there were rockets fired against the American embassy or close to the American embassy, it was the government of Iraq who said, we deny, we, uh, refuse, we reject such an act, we are against it. This country is not a battlefield for Iran or any other party, even if they are Iraqis. So things, are, the, things have changed from occupation forces and what the Iraqis did uh, attacking the occupation forces. And today the Americans are uh, forces requested to stay by Ira the Iraqi government unlike Syria, where they are still occupation forces, consider occupation forces, because they are there not under the grace of the government of Damascus. Hmm. Well, I mean, America's been fighting, whether you technically call them occupation forces or not, they've been fighting in alliance with, at the behest of, the Bada Brigade since 2003. I mean, you mentioned al-Mahdi. He's from the Supreme Council for Islamic Revolution in Iraq, the Hakim faction. Uh, all the previous prime ministers before him uh, Amiri, Maliki, and Jafari, they were all from the Dawa party. These are all Iran's best friends. Not that they're total sock puppets or anything, but these are exactly the people that the Ayatollahs wanted America to put in power there. Yeah, but uh, don't forget that in uh, 2014, 2000 and, uh, not 2014, 2016, 17, and 18, the U.S. forces backed uh, Hadi al-Amri, the Hashd shabi and all the uh, pro-Iranian groups mm -hmm. with uh, their jet against ISIS. Right. And they were uh, fighting alongside one another. I can tell you, Iran doesn't need to do much in the Middle East to gain power. I guess it not. Just, it, <laughs> Sit back and watch the just, Americans it, do it all for them. Exactly. Just to collect behind the American mistakes. Yeah. The Americans interfere in Iraq, and they overthrown Saddam Hussein, and they gave the power 
to uh, the Shia in the country, but then they've turned the whole country into a mess and they refuse to help the government of, Iraq, of Baghdad when ISIS occupied 40% of the country. They literally refused and watched ISIS growing and expanding. That was a big mistake when the Kurd, the best ally of the US, Masoud Barzani, comes out and say, it is only Iran who supported us and stopped us, stopped ISIS on the gate of Erbil. Otherwise, uh, ISIS would have occupied Kurdistan when the prime minister of Iraq said exactly the same. So, I mean, when you want to change the regime in Syria and Iran move forward to support the regime in, say, in Syria and the U.S. and uh, around 50 or 60 other countries supporting regime change and helping all these jihadists and takfiri, including those responsible of 9-11, to flock into the country and support the regime change to create a huge Islamic a state in, in Syria and to create a failed state. And all that Iran managed with uh, the support of Russia and the Syrian army to defeat it and to regain power. And of course it will have power. It's just collecting behind the American states. All right. So now back to the current crisis for a minute here. Elijah, you write that Iran has established a joint operations room to inform all its allies in Lebanon, Syria, Iraq, Yemen, and Afghanistan of every step it is adopting in confronting the U.S. in case of an all-out war in the Middle East. So does that translate also to real kind of command and control cooperation with them and coordination in the event of a war breaking out that you guys shoot these missiles here and you guys blow up that thing there? And also, uh, when you say Afghanistan, are you talking about Hazaras or who are Iran's allies in Afghanistan? In Afghanistan, Iran, uh, Iranian diplomats were killed and the Taliban were occupying the country and were killing every single pro-Iranian in Afghanistan. When the war, when the Bush decided to occupy in Afghanistan and thought it's a matter, matter of a month, like every American president say at every war, he starts but he never finishes. Um, uh, Iran started to support the Afghan people in their insurgency against the Americans. And that is only after uh, when the uh, Americans started to impose sanctions on Iran and make the Iranian life difficult. Because before that, I remember uh, Ambassador uh, Crocker, uh, Crocker um, the U.S. ambassador, used to meet with envoy of Qasem Soleimani in Iraq to attack the Taliban and to um, and and receive the full support of Iran against the uh, against Taliban in Afghanistan when the relationship was at its best uh, level. But then everything changed. Today, Iran hosts the Taliban, like Qatar, like the Taliban who are talking to the United States, also negotiating with them. Iran also has a footprint in Afghanistan, has allies there. And, can, and is supplying them with uh, everything they need, exactly like Iran has uh, allies in Iraq and has allies in Syria and in Lebanon. And what I meant by the operational room is not you go and attack this target or that target. It is, uh, it is important to coordinate and to make sure that messages are sent from different parts, from different countries. So if the U U.S. want to start a war, the U.S. will may, will understand that it is not going to be limited to the Iranian geography, but it's going to expand into Syria, Lebanon, Iraq, uh, Afghanistan, and Yemen. And the response is going to be from all these countries, uh, maybe simultaneously, maybe not, depending on the intensity of the war, if the war breaks. Mm -hmm. Well, you know what? You hear all the time, or at least some of the time, from critics that there's a concern that there could be Hezbollah attacks against targets in Europe, too. Well, to make it very simple, we all know that Netanyahu came out. It is all in all newspapers. It was uh, published at the time of Israel, the Jerusalem Post, Haaretz, and other Western newspapers. 
where Netanyahu bragged about it was him who convinced Trump to tear apart the nuclear deal. So why go and attack Europe? I mean, Israel just next door to Hezbollah. They just need to attack the the person or the country or the government who is responsible to bring the U.S. to the verge of war or to start a war. So why going to um, uh, to Europe to uh, go through all this trouble to attack a country or a continent that is not declaring animosity against Hezbollah, even if the U.K. put Hezbollah on the list of terrorism? So they just have Israel next door to attack. Yeah. And in Iraq, they have uh, U.S. bases all over Iraq. They have, um, in Afghanistan, they have U.S. bases. In uh, Yemen, they can attack the Saudis that are American allies. So why go to another continent and bother when they have all their strengths and power and all the logistic in Lebanon to attack Israel next door? Mm. And especially with the air base at Qatar and the Navy base at Bahrain. I mean, even if the whole fleet is out to sea, they can still bomb the hell out of that base, uh, which would cost the Americans a lot to try to replace it anyway. And then all the guys in Kuwait, how many troops are in Kuwait right now? Must be more than 10,000. Yes, there are around 50,000 in all over the Middle East, but Mm -hmm. between 35 and 50. But um, just to tell you, uh, I, I, I honestly don't think there's going to be a war. Yeah, me I either. Think all For all the like- reasons that we're talking about. It's just, if you were the secretary of the army, you would have to be telling the president that this is just too much, right? The chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. We just don't want to do this. The Air Force might talk a big game, but essentially, escalation dominance, we don't have it. They do. I don't think the common sense is stopping the war. I think what is stopping the war today is Trump electoral campaign. This is what is stopping the war. All right. Well, I guess we'll take it. I mean, part of that is that the American people, even without knowing the details, are just finding it harder and harder to believe in this stuff. You know, we went to war against 400 bandits 20 years ago and haven't been able to resolve this problem yet. It just keeps getting worse. And you don't have to be any kind of expert to see that something is not right here. Not only that, it is not to underestimate the power of your enemy. In this case, Iran. If Iran is your enemy, Mr. Trump, Iran is not going to sit and watch. The power of Iran, uh, Iran is the strongest country in the Middle East. Iran has allies where no other country in the Middle East has allies. The U.S. doesn't have allies in the Middle East. The Saudis are afraid of the U.S. because the the U.S. is the one who is keeping the Saudi regime in place. The uh, Emirati is the same. The Bahraini is the same. Otherwise, if if the uh, Americans hold on to their principle of democracy and ask these countries to abide by democracy, they will not last one day. And not because if Iran is going to attack them. Iran doesn't need to do anything. Are the population asking for democracy and election? There is one family governing Saudi Arabia since decades. And even their passport is called by the name of this family. These are not the US ally. When Trump calls the Saudi and say, I want $500 million today, and he gets the 500 million, not because he's an ally, it's because they are afraid of him. So, but Iran has ideological ally. Iran has a non-ideological and secular ally, like Syria. Iran has a friend in Iraq, uh, non-ideological. Abdel, Adel Abdel Mahdi, the prime minister, is not, uh, uh, is not holding on to his religion. He is a, a businessman. He is a a prime minister, he's a, 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 an expert in finance, and he uh, he's not uh, religiously bound. So Iran has ally, the Houthi are not Shia, the Houthi are Zaidi and closer to the Sunni rather than the Shia, but they are their allies. So Iran has allies and the strongest country in the Middle East. You're not going to uh, fight with Saudi and the Emirati 
against such a country and expect this country not to retaliate. Right. It should be noted for the American audience, too, that to a man, every single Iran hawk also said we must get rid of Saddam Hussein in brackets for Iran. And so uh, it seems like if that was the rule that Sure, you can be an Iran hawk as long as you didn't support war against Iraq, then fine. Then that would be the end of the argument because they would there would be nobody left on the hawk side. But so let me ask you this. What do we do now? Because Trump can't just go back to the deal and the Ayatollah clearly is not going to sign a better deal and let Trump win this thing on those grounds. And so we're kind of stuck. And, you know, you talk about those electoral pressures, but... Pressures in D.C. and among donors and these kinds of things rather than voters, all of those kind of pressures can really lead toward proving what a tough guy you are and not letting that Ayatollah push you around and all this kind of deal. And it seems like all of those kind of uh, incentives can backfire and turn right around. And we don't really have another way out of this. I mean, Trump didn't give the Ayatollah another out other than, you know, bowing down and kissing his feet. If you read that, you know, the Pompeo speech at Heritage and they keep adding conditions, you have to give up all of your missiles and, you know, probably sink your boats and whatever else. There's, there's no way they can give into this thing. So what do you think is going to happen now? Well, obviously, there is very clearly a bad advisors to President Trump at the White House for the thing that putting um, imposing sanction on the Granatullah who has and no property and no intention to go to Las Vegas or go to Disneyland and to go around New York shopping uh, and to put a, a, a sanction a, a foreign minister that is the gate of the diplomacy. So it, it, Trump is ill-advised in this matter. Now, what is the way out? I think Trump is a businessman and as a businessman and he wants to be re-elected, I will not be surprised to hear that Trump is going to freeze the sanction for another six months. That's one. Two, China already is defying the U.S. and is starting to uh, buy the oil. And uh, the China started to uh, buy oil from Iran, and they have started with one million barrel uh, the other day, and they are buying the Iranian oil. And third is um, Trump and President Putin met during the G20 in Osaka. And uh, I think uh, Putin is capable of taking on him things and then propose to Trump the way out because Trump is stuck and he wants a way out. So the only way out is to somebody else to say, hey, take it on me. I'm going to offer the solution. I'm going to uh, de-escalate and find a way out for everybody uh, and let everybody comes out as a winner and nobody has lost in this battle. And uh, let us live, uh, allow the Middle East to uh, get rid of this uh, war shadow uh, upon that is floating for the last few months. So, and this, that is, these are the possibilities. Iran sells its oil and gives the damn about Trump Trump will see that his sanctions are not working, then he will move forward and arm himself with pragmatism and propose a way out. And um, uh, the other chance is Putin to come forward with a plan agreed with Trump and uh, is also agreed with the Iranians. These are the possibilities. But at the end of the day, Iran today no longer trusts the Americans. Iran today no longer trusts the Europeans because the Europeans signed a, a contract that is the uh, nuclear deal agreement, and they're not capable of holding to their word and their bound. So your word is your bound and your signature is your bound doesn't work anymore. The uh, Europeans are just offering words to Iran and uh, Iran is uh, no longer uh, trusting the European, but that doesn't mean Iran is going to go uh, toward building a nuclear bomb. Iran doesn't want a nuclear bomb and doesn't need a nuclear bomb. Iran has its uh, classical uh, firepower, the missile that are capable of hitting anywhere, and uh, is waiting for the world to decide. Otherwise, try, uh, Iran is going to pull out uh, partially on the uh, uh, 7th of uh, July, 
and it's going to start pulling out gradually until it completely pulls out in a year from now to more or less around the 8th of May 2020 before the election, 2020 before a Trump election to make sure they contribute to his defeat. All right, you guys, that's Elijah Magnier. He's at ejmagnier.com. That's I-E-R, ejmagnier.com. Iran and Trump on the edge of the abyss is one. And also, Iran has warned to target Arab countries in case of war. Thanks again, Elijah. Thank you, Scott. All right, you guys, and that has been Anti-War Radio for this morning. I'm your host, Scott Horton. Find my full interview archive, more than 5,000 of them now, going back to 2003 at scotthorton.org. I'm here every Sunday from 8.30 to 9 on KPFK 90.7 FM in L.A. See you next week.